Hey, thanks for joining me and welcome as we continue to look at the transforming power of Easter. We're looking at changing doubt into assurance. Assurance that impacts and transforms the present uh, that we walk in today. And that's what uh, the, the resurrected Christ, the, the, the truth of Easter, that's what it does for us. It gives us assurance, assurance of God working all things out, the assurance of the presence of God through Christ Jesus our Lord and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we have that assurance that transforms our, our present reality uh, and, and, and grants us that peace, uh, that wholeness and completeness and tranquility uh, that comes from knowing that God is in control of all things and that he has taken care of all things through Christ Jesus. Now, of course, what we're looking at is the encounter of uh, of Thomas, who, remember yesterday, as so we were looking at this, simply refused to believe. I won't believe until I see it with my own eyes and touch it with my own hands. And so um, that's sort of throwing down the gauntlet. This is what it's going to take for me to believe. And amazingly, eight, di eight days later, Jesus does that for him. Uh, I don't think that's the way things work now. <laughs> I think uh, we meet Jesus in, in the New Testament in the words of these witnesses and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit who, who um, convicts us of the truth of the gospel and reveals that to us. Uh, and then we res either respond or don't respond to that truth. It's the same as we'll see with, with Thomas, to respond or not to respond uh, to the truth of Jesus Christ. So we're picking this up in verse 26. And after eight days, again, his disciples were inside and Thomas with them. Now, that means that this was on Sunday. This is the Sunday after Easter Sunday. And interestingly, uh, the disciples meet again, or they're together again on Sunday. And I think uh, in John writing this, many scholars believe that John is writing to basically a Jewish audience or a proselyte audience, Jews and proselytes. Uh, and in that case, what's a proselyte? Well, a proselyte was a Gentile who converted to Judaism. Uh, and there were also God-fearers who, that's what they were called, God-fearers who did not convert to Judaism, didn't get circumcised and all of that, but they believed the Torah, they believed in everything, didn't want to do everything else and wanted to go to temple and those kind of things in synagogue. Uh, so the God fears. And if that is the case, then it's getting across the reason why that the early church and the church continues to meet on Sunday, because it is the most significant day. It is the resurrection day of the Lord. It is the, uh, it, it is the, uh, the day of Pentecost. It is the day of appearing of Jesus uh, to, to several. Uh, and so it became the day to meet uh, for uh, the early church and has carried on to our day to meet together on Sunday. Uh, it's not commanded anywhere in Scripture to meet together on Sunday. That is a tradition that is carried on from the early church. Uh, I suppose you could be faithful. The Scripture only tells us not to neglect our gathering together uh, for the purpose of worship and instruction. So, uh, and building one another up. So we have that. Uh, but the particular day it is tradition. That's the day. That, and, that, and that's an amazing thing because these Jews, uh, to uh, change from Sabbath to Sunday uh, as the day of worship uh, is tremendous. And certainly that was the case uh, by mid-century, uh, mid-first century in 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 the end of Paul's life, uh, that was the standards were already there. Uh, and certainly when you get into the second century uh, and third with the Didache, uh, you also have the instruction of when to meet and prayers and, and baptisms and so forth and how to do things uh, that was there in the early church. So significant that this is on Sunday that Jesus appears once again. And of course, Jesus is the one who's choosing when he's going to appear. But Thomas is present with them. Uh, Jesus came, the doors having been shut, the doors are still shut and locked, so they are still afraid, still fearful of the Sanhedrin, still fearful that uh, they're going to get arrested and that they, they're going to be uh, stoned to death uh, because the Sanhedrin, of course, ruled against Jesus as a false prophet, false teacher, and blasphemer and all of that. 
So they're still afraid. And those who would say that the preceding passage that we looked at last week, I mean the week before last, that that preceding passage that speaks of Jesus breathing and telling them to receive the Holy Spirit, that that's John's Pentecost, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It didn't change their lives very much because they're still behind locked doors. Thomas was left out because nothing like that happens in the appearance to Thomas. And so I just have to disagree with that uh, and just and throw that out, um, out of, reject that out of hand. It just doesn't work. So they are behind locked doors, still, still afraid, uh, still scared, uh, even though they have seen the resurrected Lord, even though they believe uh, that he is the resurrected Lord, they're still afraid. And so Jesus says to them, and this is the first thing he says, this is the thing that he says to us as well. He says to them, as he stood in their midst, of course, startling them in their fearful state, he says, peace uh, unto you, or peace be to you, peace to you. Uh, what kind of peace? Well, uh, that peace that is assurance, that, that peace that comes from God, that tranquility that comes from having the assurance that God is in control and is working things out, and that grants you um, peace in the present. You know he's working it out, you know he's working it out, and it's going to be worked out in the future, and it's being worked out right now, and you may not understand it, you may not see it clearly, but you have the assurance that God is working it out, and, and the one who grants peace is standing right there in your midst, and how we desperately need the peace that only Jesus Christ can give today, when there's so much that would rob us of peace, so much that would rob us of, of that tranquility, uh, but we have the assurance that even in the midst of everything that's going on in this crazy world, whether it's uh, the whole transgender ideology that's being foisted upon us or the uh, LGBTQ question mark and all this other stuff that gets thrown in there that's being pushed on us and uh, even in big companies like Target and others that are adopting and promoting it and we have a whole month in June that is Pride Month. That's something to be proud of. Um, wickedness, sinfulness, and godliness, godlessness is something to be lifted up and praised for sure. Uh, and I say that sarcastically. So that you have all of this that is going on and we desperately need the peace that only Jesus can bring. Now, that is not to say that we uh, that, that that as believers we hate uh, homosexual homosexuals or that we hate uh, those who are transgender. It is that we don't agree with uh, the brokenness that those those uh, conditions indicate. Uh, and so we speak Christ into that. The, the love of Christ is to be spoken into that. The peace of Christ is to be given into that. Uh, and so Jesus comes, and in their midst, he speaks peace to these early believers, and he speaks peace to us, and we need to embrace that peace of Christ and share that with those around us. And so immediately, Jesus says to Thomas, reach here your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side. And so clearly, uh, Jesus doesn't have to manifest his presence to hear what we say, because he is giving Thomas right back exactly the words that he spoke, saying, I won't believe unless I put my finger in the nail prints, unless I put, put my hand in his side. Jesus invites him. Here, here it is. Um, here's what you asked for. Uh, and we have no indication that, that, that um, Thomas took him up on it. He may have. We don't know. It doesn't say. And then Jesus says this, after he, after he says, okay, here you go, here's the, here's the wounds, put your hand in there, put your finger in there, here it is. And he says this, and be not unbelieving, but believing. Um, it, that's, that's a perfectly good way of translating that. However, most of the time, um, it is used as a substantive in the New Testament so that it would be uh, stop being an unbeliever and be a believer. So here it is. Here's the evidence. What's it going to be? Stop being an unbeliever and become a believer. Um, Thomas is a faithful disciple up to the crucifixion. In a Christian sense, he's not. He has not believed on the resurrected Christ. He hasn't believed in the finished work of Jesus at this point. Jesus appears to him 
offers him the evidence that he asked for. Will he accept that evidence or will he reject it? That's the question. And you almost wait with bated breath. What's he going to do? What's the decision he's going to make? And that's true every time the gospel is presented. There is always uh, implicit, if not explicitly stated, there is this, uh, uh, will you believe? There is the, the question, will you believe the evidence or will you reject it? Stop being an unbeliever and become a believer. Be a believer. Here's the evidence. There must be mental acceptance of that evidence. Yes, is there a transformation that takes place? Yes, once we receive it, does the Holy Spirit convict us of the truth of this? Yes, I'm not denying God's work through the Holy Spirit in doing this. What I am denying is that we don't have a choice in the matter. I believe that it must be a free will choice. We must be able to choose. We must be able to respond to the love of God without the coercive power of God. I believe God woos and draws, attracts, but stops short of coercing us into believing in Jesus. That would be to kick the door down. I do not accept the proposition that uh, we... Uh, that we are saved and then we become believers. I do not accept that because it's nowhere taught in the New Testament. It is always that we believe, have faith, believe, and then we are saved. So this is the, this is the, the moment of truth. Will Thomas believe or will he not? And we have the very next sentence, Thomas answered and said to Jesus, this is a transaction not with Thomas and the other disciples, not with Thomas, Jesus, and the other disciples. This is a transaction between Jesus and Thomas, and that's true for everyone who comes to faith in Christ. That's true to ev for everyone who believes in Jesus or rejects the truth and the evidence of who Jesus is. It is a, it is a transaction, a relational transaction between Jesus and the individual. And that's what's transpiring here. Will he or will he not? And this is what Thomas answers and said to him, my Lord and my God. The Lord of his life is also his God. That is a transforming moment in the life of Thomas. My Lord, my master, yes, it does mean that. And Caesar was the one who was called Kurios. Uh, Lord, my king, but it also ties into Lord as it's used in the, uh, this kurios is used for Yahweh in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Would he have known that? Sure. Uh, would the readers of this have known that? Sure they would. Is there a connection being made? Absolutely. That Jesus is, is God. That, um, that he is deity just as God the Father is. They are uh, different persons to be sure, but the same essence. So uh, the second person of, of the uh, Godhead, uh, of the triune Godhead. So you have God the Father, you have Jesus the Son, you have the Holy Spirit who's not been given yet at Pentecost, but certainly the Holy Spirit is working and is present in the midst of all of this. And there is this transforming uh, thing that takes place because of this acceptance uh, and immediately, my Lord and my God. Does that mean that Thomas had complete understanding of everything? No, but he understands that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Lord, and that God's saving purposes are being uh, carried out through, uh, through Jesus Christ, this crucified Messiah and resurrected King of Kings, and he recognizes that. I pray that you do too as well. We're going to talk some more about this tomorrow as John finishes up that chapter and the purpose of, of writing so that we might be believers as well. I pray that that's true in your life, my friend. I pray that you know uh, the love of God in Christ Jesus because in Christ Jesus you have uh, forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here and right now. And if you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you have the peace of God as well. How desperately we need the peace that Jesus can bring and only Jesus can bring in our lives. Listen, I pray that you have that. I'll see you tomorrow. I pray God's blessings rest upon you. Until tomorrow, shalom, my friend.